Chapter Ten of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry D. Thoreau by Benjamin Franklin Sanborn. Chapter Ten in Wood and Field. Except the Indians themselves, whose woodcraft he never tires of celebrating, few Americans were ever more at home in the open air than Thoreau not even his friend john brown who like himself suggested the indian by the delicacy of his perceptions and his familiarity with all that goes forward or stands still in wood and field thoreau could find his path in the woods at night he said better by his feet than his eyes he was a good swimmer says emerson a good runner skater boatman and would outwalk most countrymen in a day's journey and the relation of body to mind was still finer the length of his walk uniformly made the length of his writing if shut up in the house he did not write at all in his last illness says channing his habit of engrossing his thoughts in a journal which had lasted for a quarter of a century his outdoor life of which he used to say if he omitted that all his living ceased this now became so incontrovertibly a thing of the past that he said once standing at the window i cannot see on the outside at all we thought ourselves great philosophers in those wet days when we used to go out and sit down by the wall sides this was absolutely all he was ever heard to say of that outward world during his illness neither could a stranger in the least infer that he had ever a friend in field or wood this outdoor life began as early as he could recollect and his special attraction to rivers woods and lakes was a thing of his boyhood he had begun to collect indian relics before leaving college and was a diligent student of natural history there whether he was naturally an observer or not which has been denied in a kind of malicious paradox let his life work attest early in eighteen forty seven he made some collections of fishes turtles etc in concord for agassiz then newly arrived in america and i have in a letter of may three eighteen forty seven this account of their reception i carried them immediately to mr agassiz who was highly delighted with them some of the species he had seen before but never in so fresh condition others as the breams and the pout he had seen only in spirits and the little turtle he knew only from the books i am sure you would have felt fully repaid for your trouble if you could have seen the eager satisfaction with which he surveyed each fin and scale he said the small mud turtle was really a very rare species quite distinct from the snapping turtle the breams and pout seemed to please the professor very much he would gladly come up to concord to make a spearing excursion as you suggested but is drawn off by numerous and pressing engagements on the twenty seventh of may thoreau's correspondent says mr agassiz was very much surprised and pleased at the extent of the collections you sent during his absence the little fox he has established in comfortable quarters in his back yard where he is doing well among the fishes you sent there is one probably two new species june first in other collections other new species were discovered much to agassiz's delight who never failed afterward to cultivate thoreau's society when he could but the poet avoided the man of science having no love for dissection though he recognized in agassiz the qualities that gave him so much distinction the paper on katahdin and the maine woods which horace greeley bought at a jew's bargain and sold to a publisher for seventy-five dollars was the journal of a visit made to the highest mountain of maine during thoreau's second summer at walden an aunt of his had married in bangor maine and her daughters had again married there so that the young forester of concord had kinsmen on the penobscot engaged in converting the maine forest into pine lumber at the end of august in eighteen forty six while his carlyle manuscript was passing from greeley to griswold and from griswold to graham and from graham to the philadelphia typesetters thoreau himself was on his way from boston to bangor and on the first day of september he started with his cousin from bangor 
to explore the upper waters of the penobscot and climb the summit of katahdin the forest region about this mountain had been explored in eighteen thirty seven by dr jackson the state geologist a brother-in-law of mr emerson but no poet before thoreau had visited these solitudes and described his experiences there james russell lowell did so a few years later and early in the century hawthorne longfellow and emerson had tested the solitude of the maine woods and written about them the verses of emerson describing his own experiences there not so well known as they should be are often thought to imply thoreau though they were written before emerson had known his younger friend whose after adventures they portray with felicity in unploughed maine he sought the lumberer's gang where from a hundred lakes young rivers sprang he trod the unplanted forest floor whereon the all-seeing sun for ages hath not shone where feeds the moose and walks the surly bear and up the tall mast runs the woodpecker he saw beneath dim aisles in odorous beds the slight linnea hang its twin-born heads and bless the monument of the man of flowers which breathes his sweet fame through the northern bowers he heard when in the grove at intervals with sudden roar the aged pine-tree falls one crash the death hymn of the perfect tree declares the close of its green century through these green tents by eldest nature dressed he roamed content alike with man and beast where darkness found him he lay glad at night there the red morning touched him with its light three moons his great heart him a hermit made so long he roved at will the boundless shade thus much is a picture of the main forests and may have been suggested in part by the woodland life of dr jackson there while surveying the state but what follows is the brave proclamation of the poet for himself and his heroes among whom thoreau and john brown must be counted since it declares their creed and practice while in the last couplet the whole inner doctrine of transcendentalism is set forth the timid it concerns to ask their way and fear what foes in caves and swamps can stray to make no step until the event is known and ills to come as evils past bemoan not so the wise no timid watch he keeps to spy what danger on his pathway creeps go where he will the wise man is at home his hearth the earth his hall the azure dome where his clear spirit leads him there's his road by god's own light illumined and foreshowed thoreau may have heard these verses read by their author in his study before he set forth on his first journey to maine in eighteen thirty eight they were first published in the dial in october eighteen forty but are omitted for some reason in a partial edition of emerson's poems in eighteen seventy six he never complied with this description so far as to spend three months in the maine woods even in the three campaigns which he made there in eighteen forty six in eighteen fifty three and in eighteen fifty seven for in none of these did he occupy three weeks and in all but little more than a month his account of them as now published makes a volume by itself which his friend channing edited two years after thoreau's death and which contains the fullest record of his studies of the american indian it was his purpose to develop these studies into a book concerning the indian and for this purpose he made endless readings in the jesuit fathers in books of travel and in all the available literature of the subject but the papers he had thus collected were not left in such form that they could be published and so much of his untiring diligence seems now lost almost thrown away doubtless his friends and editors upon call will one day print detached portions of these studies from entries in his journals and from his commonplace books in his explorations of concord and its vicinity as well as in those longer foot journeys which he took among the mountains and along the seashore of new england from eighteen thirty eight to eighteen sixty thoreau's habits were those of an experienced hunter though he seldom used a gun in his years of manhood upon this point he says in walden almost every new england boy among my contemporaries 
shouldered a fowling piece between the ages of ten and fourteen and his hunting and fishing grounds were not limited like the preserves of an english nobleman but were more boundless than even those of the savage perhaps i have owed to fishing and hunting when quite young my closest acquaintance with nature they early introduce us to and detain us in scenery with which otherwise at that age we should have little acquaintance fishermen hunters woodchoppers and others spending their lives in the fields and woods in a peculiar sense a part of nature themselves are often in a more favourable mood for observing her in the intervals of their pursuits than philosophers or poets even who approach her with expectation she is not afraid to exhibit herself to them i have actually fished from the same kind of necessity that the first fishers did i have long felt differently about fowling and sold my gun before i went to the woods i did not pity the fishes nor the worms as for fowling during the last years that i carried a gun my excuse was that i was studying ornithology and sought only new or rare birds but i am now inclined to think there is a finer way of studying ornithology than this it requires so much closer attention to the habits of the birds that if for that reason only i have been willing to omit the gun we cannot but pity the boy who has never fired a gun he is no more humane while his education has been sadly neglected emerson mentions that thoreau preferred his spy-glass to his gun to bring the bird nearer to his eye and says also of his patience in outdoor observation he knew how to sit immovable a part of the rock he rested on until the bird the reptile the fish which had retired from him should come back and resume its habits nay moved by curiosity should come to him and watch him and i have thought that emerson had thoreau in mind when he described his forester he took the colour of his vest from rabbit's coat or grouse's breast for as the wood kinds lurk and hide so walks the woodman unespied the same friend said of him it was a pleasure and a privilege to walk with him he knew the country like a fox or bird and passed through it as freely by paths of his own under his arm he carried an old music-book to press plants in his pocket his diary and pencil a spy-glass for birds microscope jack-knife and twine he wore straw hat stout shoes strong grey trousers to brave shrub oaks and smilax and to climb a tree for a hawk's or squirrel's nest he waded into the pool for the water plants and his strong legs were no insignificant part of his armour his intimacy with animals suggested what thomas fuller records of butler the apiologist that either he had told the bees things or the bees had told him snakes coiled round his leg the fishes swam into his hand and he took them out of the water he pulled the woodchuck out of its hole by the tail and took the foxes under his protection from the hunters he confessed that he sometimes felt like a hound or a panther and if born among indians would have been a fell hunter but restrained by his massachusetts culture he played out the game in the mild form of botany and ichthyology his power of observation seemed to indicate additional senses he saw as with microscope heard as with ear-trumpet and his memory was a photographic register of all he saw and heard every fact lay in order and glory in his mind a type of the order and beauty of the whole it was this poetic and coordinating vision of the natural world which distinguished thoreau from the swarm of naturalists and raised him to the rank of a philosopher even in his tedious daily observations channing no less than emerson has observed and noted this trait giving to his friend the exact title of poet naturalist and also in his poem the wanderer bestowing on him the queer name of eidolon which he thus explains so strangely was the general current mixed with his vexed native blood in its crank wit that as a mirror shone the common world to this observing youth whom noting thence i called eidolon ever firm to mark swiftly reflected in himself the whole 
in an earlier poem channing had called him rudolpho and had thus portrayed his daily and nightly habits of observation i see rudolpho cross our honest fields collapsed with thought and as the staggerite at intellectual problems mastering day after day part of the world's concern nor welcome dawns nor shrinking nights him menace still adding to his list beetle and bee of what the vireo builds a pensile nest and why the pea-tweet drops her giant egg in wheezing meadows odorous with sweet break who wonders that the flesh declines to grow along his sallow pits or that his life to social pleasures careless pines away in dry seclusion and unfruitful shade i must admire thy brave apprenticeship to those dry forages although the worldling laugh in his sleeve at thy compelled devotion so shalt thou learn rudolpho as thou walk'st more from the winding lanes where nature leaves her unaspiring creatures and surpass in some fine saunter her acclivity the hint here given that thoreau injured his once robust health by his habits of outdoor study and the hardships he imposed on himself had too much truth in it growing up with great strength of body and limb and having cultivated his physical advantages by a temperate youth much exercised with manual labor in which he took pleasure thoreau could not learn the lesson of moderation in those pursuits to which his nature inclined he exposed himself in his journeys and night encampments to cold and hunger and changes of weather which the strongest cannot brave with impunity mr edward hoare who travelled with him in the maine woods in eighteen fifty seven a journey of three hundred and twenty-five miles with a canoe and an indian among the headwaters of the kennebunk penobscot and st john's rivers and who in eighteen fifty eight visited the white mountains with him remembers with a shiver to this day the rigor of a night spent on the bare rocks of mount washington with insufficient blankets thoreau sleeping from habit but himself lying wakeful all night and gazing at the coldest of full moons it was after such an experience as this on monadnock whither thoreau and channing went to camp out for a week in august eighteen sixty that the latter wrote with the night reserved companion cool and sparsely clad dream till the threefold hour with lowly voice steals whispering in thy frame rise valiant youth the dawn draws on apace envious of thee and polar in his gait advance thy limbs nor strive to heap the stones thoreau had much scorn for weakness like this and said of his comrade i fear that he did not improve all the night as he might have done to sleep this was his last excursion and he died within less than two years afterward the account of it which channing has given may therefore be read with interest he ascended such hills as monadnock by his own path would lay down his map on the summit and draw a line to the point he proposed to visit below perhaps forty miles away on the landscape and set off bravely to make the short cut the lowland people wondered to see him scaling the heights as if he had lost his way or at his jumping over their cow-yard fences asking if he had fallen from the clouds in a walk like this he always carried his umbrella and on this monadnock trip when about a mile from the station in troy new hampshire a torrent of rain came down without the umbrella his books blankets maps and provisions would all have been spoiled or the morning lost by delay on the mountain there being a thick soaking fog the first object was to camp and make tea he spent five nights in camp having built another hut to get varied views flowers birds lichens and the rocks were carefully examined all parts of the mountain were visited and as accurate a map as could be made by pocket compass was carefully sketched and drawn out in the five days spent there with notes of the striking aerial phenomena incidents of travel and natural history the fatigue the blazing sun the face getting broiled the pint cup never scoured shaving unutterable your stockings dreary having taken to peat not all the books in the world as sancho says could contain the adventures of a week in camping 
the wild free life the open air the new and strange sounds by night and day the odd and bewildering rocks amid which a person can be lost within a rod of camp the strange cries of visitors to the summit the great valley over to watazit with its thunderstorms and battles in the cloud the farmers backyards in jaffrey where the family cot can be seen bleaching on the grass but no trace of the pygmy family the dry soft air all night the lack of dew in the morning the want of water a pint being a good deal these and similar things make up some part of such an excursion these excursions were common with thoreau but less so with channing who therefore notes down many things that his friend would not think worth recording except as a part of that calendar of nature which he set himself to keep and of which his journals for more than twenty years are the record from these he made up his printed volumes and there may be read the details that he registered he had gauges for the height of the river noted the temperature of springs and ponds the tints of the morning and evening sky the flowering and fruit of plants all the habits of birds and animals and every aspect of nature from the smallest to the greatest much of this is the driest detail but everywhere you come upon strokes of beauty in a single word picture or in a page of idyllic description like this of the concord heifer which might be a poem of theocritus or one of the lost bucolics of moschus one more confiding heifer the fairest of the herd did by degrees approach as if to take some morsel from our hands while our hearts leaped to our mouths with expectation and delight she by degrees drew near with her fair limbs progressive making pretence of browsing nearer and nearer till there was wafted to us the bovine fragrance cream of all the dairies that ever were or will be and then she raised her gentle muzzle toward us and snuffed an honest recognition within hand's reach i saw it was possible for his herd to inspire with love the herdsman she was as delicately featured as a hind her hide was mingled white and fawn colour on her muzzle's tip there was a white spot not bigger than a daisy and on her side turned toward me the map of asia plain to see farewell dear heifer though thou forgettest me my prayer to heaven shall be that thou mayest not forget thyself i saw her name was sumat and by the kindred spots i knew her mother more sedate and matronly with full-grown bag and on her sides was asia great and small the plains of tartary even to the pole while on her daughters was asia minor she was not disposed to wanton with the herdsman as i walked the heifer followed me and took an apple from my hand and seemed to care more for the hand than the apple so innocent a face i have rarely seen on any creature and i have looked in the face of many heifers and as she took the apple from my hand i caught the apple of her eye there was no sinister expression she smelled as sweet as the clethra blossom for horns though she had them they were so well disposed in the right place but neither up nor down that i do not now remember she had any or take this apostrophe to the queen of night the huntress diana which is not a translation from some greek worshipper but the sincere ascription of a new england hunter of the noblest deer my dear my dewy sister let thy rain descend on me i not only love thee but i love the best of thee that is to love thee rarely i do not love thee every day commonly i love those who are less than thee i love thee only on great days thy dewy words feed me like the manna of the morning i am as much thy sister as thy brother thou art as much my brother as my sister it is a portion of thee and a portion of me which are of kin o my sister o diana thy tracks are on the eastern hill thou newly didst pass that way i the hunter saw them in the morning dew my eyes are the hounds that pursued thee i hear thee thou canst speak i cannot i fear and forget to answer i am occupied with hearing i awoke and thought of thee thou wast present to my mind how camest thou there was i not present to thee likewise in such a lofty mystical strain did this concord endymion declare his passion for nature in whose green lap he slumbers now 
on the hillside which the goddess nightly revisits o sister of the sun draw near with softly moving step and slow for dreaming not of earthly woe thou seest endymion sleeping here End of chapter 10